were here last year might have a sense of déjà vu about this panel, because we were talking about a similar subject uh, with these two esteemed members of the global monetary scene a year ago. So it gives us a perfect opportunity to, to check in on the future for inflation, but as we were just discussing, the future of inflation to some extent is the future of the global economy. So welcome, gentlemen. Um, Nuriel, let me start with you, because I know that you're always so upbeat in your prognostications uh, for the world. Since we last met, uh, the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates about eight times. When we were last here, the federal funds rate was still at 1%. It's now over five, potentially at a peak, certainly, or certainly we think it may be taking a break. Have they done too much or too little? Um, first of all, great pleasure being back here in Qatar. Uh, great honor again to be with you, Governor. Um, I think they've done um, a significant amount, but uh, my view is that uh, for a number of reasons, inflation is going to surprise on the upside, both in the United States uh, and in Europe. Uh, labor markets are very tight, unemployment rate at historical lows. Uh, there is aging of population, restriction to migration. In the U.S., uh, collapse in labor force participation rate, the great resignation. And now there's the beginning of labor strife. So wage growth is excessive. Uh, there are geopolitical tensions in the world that are going to fragment the world. They may lead to further spikes in commodity prices. Um, the Fed is not done yet. Even in June, we may have another hike, and certainly the ECB uh, has much more work to do. So I think that the tightness of the labor market, the existence of geopolitical stuff, deglobalization, other factors imply that inflation is going to be more persistent. It's falling, but not fast enough. And therefore, a central bank is going to face a dilemma, or better, a trilemma. They want to achieve uh, price stability. They want to avoid a hard landing. They want financial stability. But if they have to raise rates more, as I expect, to fight inflation eventually, there may be a hard landing and financial instability. And if they care about growth and financial stability and they don't raise rates enough, then there's a risk of a de-anchoring of inflation and inflation expectations. So I commend them for what they've done. I think that the big challenges are going to be ahead of us. And <clears throat> Your Excellency, you face, I guess, a second challenge in the sense that you have to assess the current outlook for inflation and how the Federal Reserve is approaching it, but also have to consider whether the link with US policy, the peg with the dollar, is still the right one for, for your country. So how are you seeing it? Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, actually, as you mentioned, that uh, uh, Qatar currency is pegged to, to the US dollar. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we believe that uh, this uh, policy uh, is appropriate for for your uh, Qatar economy, and we don't see uh, any an immediate need for uh, to change that policy. As my uh, colleague uh, here mentioned about uh, the inflation, yes, we uh, uh, globally the inflation last year many countries have experienced their uh, highest level of inflation for many decades. Uh, however, uh, we have witnessed in the last few quarters that uh, the inflation, uh, there was an improvement in the inflation level. Um, it's affecting, yes, the global growth. There is no doubt about, uh, about this one. But uh, we, have now, um, uh, we have now to balance between the uh, price stability, uh, growth, and uh, financial uh, stability. Uh, so central banks uh, has no central banks over the world have no other cha uh, option other than to bring the inflation to its target level, because we do believe that inflation is uh, the enemy of the economy, and the inflation is going to hurt the even household pockets. So um, inflation is in downward trajectory, but what we are uh, seeing now is a, a sticky inflation. Uh, and it's going to um, uh, going to decline at a slower rate, 
uh, and it will take a long time uh, in my forecast until it reach the central bank's uh, target, uh, target level. And can I just follow up, because we just wanted to clarify something. Um, at the time around the period of the last Federal Reserve interest rate hike, um, your central bank appeared, uh, said it was holding and then retracted and decided to raise the quarter percentage point. So I just want to make sure I understand what was the thinking there? What happened there? Yeah. Um, we, as as I, we, I mentioned before, that we are pegged to US dollar and uh, we are, mon and we are uh, taking our decision accordingly with, uh, to uh, US Federal Reserve uh, decisions. And uh, what, what our decision, what we take, it what is appropriate for our uh, economy. So uh, uh, there was no doubt that uh, we will uh, increase our interest rate uh, during that time. So the first there was a, there was just no, a, it was it was a media mistake. It wasn't uh, the decision. So uh, right. our decision is to increase. As you know, you uh, us. Uh, raise their interest rate and in sometimes we have hold our interest rate uh, during the increase uh, we narrowed the spread between uh, us and uh, qatari uh, deposit rate the qmr uh, deposit rate to 25 basis point the spread right now before it was 100 basis point and we see it it's uh, useful and it is effective for our economy at this time now nuria you uh make an argument that many people make, that looking at the stickiness of inflation and su the suggestion that probably um, the Federal Reserve will have to do more, and I think certainly the European Central Bank um, will have to do more. The argument that one would hear, um, particularly perhaps from those in the financial sector against that, is that there is a credit crunch building, a delayed consequence of the many, many rate hikes we've already had which is going to have a bigger than expected, is going to have a, a longer term impact on activity, on lending, on small businesses, job creation. Is there a risk that you're underestimating the problems that are building on the credit side? Um, no, I do agree there'll be a credit crunch and that's going to slow down economic activity. But even there will be a slowdown of economic activity, labor markets are so tight, they need an outright uh, economic contraction for creating enough slack in labor market to slow down wage growth. I also think that the geopolitical factors are going to be keeping uh, overall not just energy but also commodity prices higher. And I think we're too much um, thinking about the short run. If you think about the medium term, the reason why we had low inflation in the great moderation was not just because we had inflation target. We have a series of positive aggregate supply shocks the last for decades, trade, globalization, China, Russia, India, emerging markets, joining the global labor supply, production of goods, services, commodities, weak labor, technological innovation, migration from south to north, a geopolitical peace dividend that helped stabilize the world. And now we have a series of just a reverse, medium long-term negative aggregate supply shock. We have deglobalization and protectionism, we have reshoring of manufacturing and friendshoring rather than offshoring. We have aging of population, advanced economies and emerging markets. We have restrictions to migration. We have a geopolitical depression that's going to fragment the global economy and decouple and lead to balkanization of global supply chains. We have the effects of global climate change on both energy prices and on food prices. As we saw, COVID-19 leads to stagflationary shock that increase costs and reduce growth. This is not going to be the last pandemic. We have cyber warfare. We have a backlash against income and wealth inequality. And now where there is a weaponization of the US dollar is leading to gradual de-dollarization. These are all factors that are reducing potential growth, increasing cost of production, and they're all negative aggregate supply shock that's going to keep inflation higher. So it was easy when you had positive supply shock to have inflation. Actually, inflation was too low. The world is very different, and that's all the structural factors that are inflationary and stagflationary over the medium term on the supply side. There are also factors on the demand side. Your Excellency, Nouriel has just given a very good description of the many, many ways the world has changed. And we've been talking about that also in the last two days, how much the global economy has changed and indeed changed in its approach 
and the money flowing and interest flowing in this region, have all those things changed and yet it's still appropriate to have the same peg, the same set up for monetary policy in Qatar? Yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, we are picked to dollar and uh, we, uh, we believe that it's appropriate for our economy and uh, it's been very effective and efficient for our economy. Uh, as well as the IMF and the reports have mentioned that uh, and highlighted that the PICT is appropriate for the GCC countries. And our main revenue is in dollar. Uh, our main export is energy and the main revenue is in dollar. So it's very appropriate uh, policy to have uh, to keep uh, uh, to keep uh, our currency picked uh, to U.S. dollar. And we do believe that uh, U.S. dollar uh, will remain uh, as a primary currency for uh, international trade settlement due to its global acceptance, uh, stability, backed by a strong uh, economy in the U.S. But just to follow up on that, I mean, many would say that the environment for the dollar has changed quite a lot. And there's certainly uh, a lot of discussion in this region and globally about reducing the use of the dollar, less confidence in the stability of the US, for sure, given the politics that we've seen over the last few years. And even the made in America policy might have implications for the, for the level of the dollar and the commitment to keeping a, a, a strong currency. So do you not think any of those things should make you think about a changing role for the dollar in your economy? Yeah. Um, uh, Stephanie, each, co each country has its own sovereign decision. We have heard from time to time in the news that uh, uh, two countries, they came together, or uh, uh, some other countries, they came together and signed an agreement to exchange uh, trade in their local currency. And this is, I believe, a sovereign uh, decision. For us, uh, we still uh, believe that uh, our picked dollar is appropriate for our economy, and we don't see any an immediate, uh, uh, immediate need to change that uh, policy since it's very effective uh, for our economy. Nuriel, where do you stand on this, about the, the, the future of the dollar, but also its uh, the broader impact on the global economy. Would, be, would we be in a better place in a few years' time if the dollar was, was waning as a reserve currency? Um, well, until now, the global currency system, a reserve system, has been unipolar, and the US dollar is the disproportionate currency as a unit of account, a means of payment, as a store of value. But I think that the US cannot take it for granted. You have... Uh, between fiscal and current account deficit. There's a risk of rising inflation and debasement of fiat currency. There has been a weaponization of the US dollar, maybe rightly so for national security and foreign policy purposes. The Chinese are worried that eventually uh, there could be a freezing of uh, uh, US treasury held by China. The same thing has happened with uh, uh, Russia, uh, and therefore they're building uh, a role for the RMB as being a reserve currency as a means of payment. They've gone to the region and they told the Saudis and others, why don't we start uh, paying you in RMB? Why don't you build up your dollar reserves? Why don't you change your peg? So far, that's not happened. I agree with the governor that uh, peg to the US dollar and having the dollar has been a source of stability for the region is going to remain. But I think that the US cannot take for granted that emerging markets, the Gulf and so on, are going to uh, take the dollar and maintain the dollar as a major reserve currency or means of payment. I think there is a meaningful risk that inflation is going to be higher. It will be the basement of fiat currencies. And therefore, we have to change the international monetary and financial system in a way in which uh, dollar assets have to be backed by something, either by real assets or financial assets or something more to give a little more credibility. Otherwise, gradually over time, a process of de-dollarization may occur and we may move from a unipolar regime to a bipolar one in which the RMB is going to become an alternative US dollar as a reserve currency. It's going to be a process, it's going to take time or decades, but uh, I think that uh, you cannot take it for granted. You know, a few years ago, 
Larry Summers joked and said that, well, you cannot replace something with nothing. And he said, uh, Europe is a museum, China is a prison, Japan is a nursing home, and Bitcoin is an experiment. But in the last few months, uh, as you have seen, they talk about uh, the dollar rising, emerging markets saying, uh, why should we keep the dollar from Brazil to those in Asia? Even talk within the Gulf on whether we should be think of U.S. as being a credible strategic partner, whether we should keep on using U.S. dollar. So I think the U.S. has to think seriously about how you maintain a system that is going to be dollar-based, but safer and more stable than the current one. So changes will have to occur over time. And many years ago, you and I both worked for Larry Summers at the U.S. Treasury when, as we were just pointing out, the U.S. debt was falling and we were paying off debt. Now we're arguing, or in Washington, they're arguing over debt. Just briefly, how does what you've just said the path of the dollar and the credibility of the dollar, how is that affected by the debt ceiling battles? Yeah, as you recollect, uh, we're during the Clinton administration where with budget surpluses, the supply of treasury was falling. We're even discussing what will happen in a world in which there is not anymore enough treasuries. Now the problem is the opposite. We have twin current account fiscal deficit. The stock of US debt is rising. There is a problem with the debt ceiling negotiations. These deficits are going to become larger and larger as central banks are doing quantitative tightening. Their demand for treasuries is going to fall. And with geopolitics now, central banks around the world, certainly among those who are rival of the U.S., are moving away from dollar assets into gold or other ones. And therefore, there'll be upward pressure on the financing costs for the United States. Even today, the dollar being major reserve currency, financing costs in the U.S. are much higher than Europe much higher than Japan and much higher than any other advanced economy. I think the trends of debt build up in the US are going to imply that regardless of what's happened with the debt ceiling, the issue of US not having any more that exorbitant privilege is going to become a key question for financial markets and the treasury markets in the specific over time. Now, Your, your Excellency, as well as being a central banker, you have the benefit of being one of the world's biggest fund managers as chair of the investment authority. The world that Nouriel has outlined, is that a world that's good for investments? How are you seeing the next year and the plans for the Investment Authority? Yeah. Uh, I believe there is always uh, an investment opportunity. And yes, I do believe there is an investment uh, opportunity even uh, in this environment, uh, which is a challenged environment. Uh, however, uh, we have to do the right due diligence uh, diversification across assets and uh, economies, uh, as well as uh, the right assessment for risk and return. If you have done this process, I believe that you will find uh, the right investment opportunity. So um, there will be always uh, an investment. Investment will not stop, but uh, the right due diligence, diversification, and risk and return is very important, especially during this uh, time. Do you worry, a lot of fund managers I talk to, they talk about a brighter future ahead, but a big adjustment that has to happen before then as, as assets are marked down and we absorb the impact of moving to higher interest rates. And the venture capital industry is one area where there are some concerns about overvaluations right now, which, and you have some exposure to that. How are you, are you concerned about that? Um, I'm not concerned about that, uh, because uh, when we uh, go through any investment, uh, we, we do the right due diligence and we make uh, the right uh, assessment for risk and return for that investment, and we put all the scenarios in a place. So um, uh, in investment world, uh, you have uh, a process before you do uh, uh, your investment decision. If you have done it properly, then you will be in better shape. Uh, no, you have, we have a large uh, portfolio on, in, in uh, QIA, Qatar Investment Authority, and uh, very well diversified across assets and also uh, across a region. And uh, we have a very limited uh, exposure to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to affected assets. Uh, so we are, I think we are doing well. And Nouriel, just to... To finish with you, and I, I try to, I hope I might be able to extract a positive word out of you, although I know it sometimes is a struggle, but there is a view that says, yes, it's bad that inflation has been sticky, it's hard to bring inflation down, 
But the other bit of news in the last year is that the economy has been much more resilient than we thought. You know, along with the stickiness of inflation has been not having a recession in many parts of the world that we thought might already have had a recession, the US, Europe. We're now taking off those, those forecasts off the table, at least for now. Do you not think that we have learned something about the underlying capacity of some of these countries in the last year? Maybe some positive news about potential growth? Or is there just, are we just building up bad news for the future? No, you're right. But uh, to build resiliency, in my view, you have to deal with the supply side bottlenecks that are going to be constrained to economic growth. Therefore, there is a huge need to invest into infrastructures, both in advanced economies, emerging markets, and the region. We need to do the green transition. It's going to imply significant investments into a variety of uh, renewable energy and other alternatives. Uh, we have to build communities throughout the world to make them more resilient for the geopolitical changes are going to be occurring. We have to invest, for example, into not just the energy and renewable, but also in green metals and other industrial metals, because the supply right now is limited. And if we want to do the transition and avoid green inflation, we have to do those types of investments. We have to invest into uh, safe assets and traditional safe assets, like long-term treasure are not going to be safe anymore. So I do believe that we can deal with the challenge of maintaining economic growth and controlling inflation. The bottlenecks are on the supply side, and any types of long-term investment is going to lead to reducing these supply bottlenecks, including avoiding excessive decoupling, excessive fragmentation, excessive uh, balkanization of the global economy is going to be important. So it's going to be up to uh, strong leaders in the region and around the world to make sure that the assets and the surpluses are being invested into real investments and financial investment, both in the region, in North America, around the world, to make sure that we're not going to face a trade-off between growth and inflation. can be done, but you have to take the long view in terms of investments. That is an excellent place on which to end. It's all down to you uh, and anyone who's able to deploy, seize these opportunities, and then we can grow and avoid some of the more gloomy scenarios. Thank you very much, both of you, for an excellent discussion. Thank you. Thank you.